Well, thanks hey, for making Illinois Family Spotlight part of your day. I'm Monty Larrick, and this is David Smith, the Executive Hello. Director of Illinois Family Action. Our guests want to make sure that the land of the free remains free and that it does not become a socialist nation. Jeannie Eyes is a West Point graduate, Army veteran, a former state representative. She's a conservative Republican and a candidate running for Illinois 6 Congressional District. It's a congressional seat uh, now held by Liberal Democrat Sean Caston. Mark Curran is the Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate. He's trying to unseat longtime Democratic incumbent Dick Durbin. Mr. Curran is an attorney, the former sheriff of Lake County, a former Lake County assistant state's attorney. Under the leadership of former Illinois Attorney General Jim Ryan, he prosecuted street gangs. Representative Eyes and Curran are both pro-life. Their opponents in this election are pro-abortion. And I'd like each of you to weigh in. Are life and liberty really at stake in this election? Representative Eyes, you want to kick that off first? 100%. Listen, the left, including my opponent, Sean Caston, have completely unmasked what their, their agenda is. And it is liberty because the reason you know this is you already know that all the Democrats in Congress already voted for H.R. 5, not, not the Senate, never made it over there. But the Democrats under Pelosi voted for H.R. 5, which not only has IFI analyzed completely, but the Heritage, Act, Heritage has analyzed and essentially it destroys the religious freedom for faith-based communities, including faith-based schools or people of faith who wanna operate in the marketplace in, in terms of uh, what medical procedures they wanna participate in or not. Uh, so this, uh, H, the signing of HR5 tells you exactly where they're going. They have not, uh, look, and we, you know this from the Democrats that control all of Illinois at this point, that when they get power and they have total power, they will put in their agenda. There's no stopping them. So the idea that, oh, that'll just never happen, it will 100% happen. There's a lot to discuss in this race, but at its core is uh, your freedom and your liberty and your constitutional rights. One thing on that I want you to remember is that the Constitution is not there for the government. The Constitution is there for you as an individual. And your first liberty and your first liberty among the First Amendment, which is the freedom of religion, is truly at stake in 2020. And we're already seeing them go after people like Little Sisters of the Poor. Mm -hmm. They have no tolerance or respect for our religious convictions. What say you, Mark? I agree, Dave. I'm running against Dick Durbin. And Dick Durbin, um, as you know, when he first ran for Congress 38 years ago, he was headliner for the pro-life dinner in Springfield. He was staunchly pro-life. Uh, he wrote letters, you know, still on that position of, of being pro-life back in, uh, so we would have first ran back in 1982. Back in 1989, he was still defending life. And then he saw the direction of the party and he went with the direction of the party. And now he's really um, somebody that, that uh, is extremely hostile towards both life and liberty as well. I've been telling this example, but I, I think it just clearly illustrates what Dick Durbin is all about. A good friend of mine, Paul Schimpf, who listeners may know, was a uh, candidate for attorney general in the state of Illinois. He ran against uh, Lisa Madigan a number of years ago. He's like Jeannie. He's a, also a uh, service academy graduate. He's from Annapolis. He was in the Marine Corps, led infantry soldiers, was the prosecutor of Saddam Hussein. Oh. Just an incredible background. Great lawyer. Gave up his state senate seat to take on a position as a federal judge. And Dick Durbin, because he was pro-life, would not allow his name to be called uh, mm -hmm. to be a federal judge. And he, he lost out on it. The White House called him and said, Dave, can you withdraw your, I mean, um, Paul, can you withdraw your name? And I, I mean, I'm somebody, David, that's so staunchly pro-life, but I'll tell you something, for a lower court district judge, I wouldn't, I mean, whether they're pro-choice or pro-life, I mean, Give me a break. Will they follow the law? Or they, do they have integrity? What have you? To have a litmus test at that lower level, it's just really, so you can see that he's really hostile towards people that believe in the sanctity of life or believe in the uh, teachings of uh, our Lord. That we're going to have to choose between making a living or following our faith. With Victor of his world, we can't have both. You're right. 
and Sheriff, as you point out, if they have a litmus test, a litmus test for this lower level judicial appointment, goodness gracious, uh, they're yeah. going to extend that to other areas. Absolutely unbelievable. And, and you know, I, I, he, you're 100% right. You're going to see that it's just going to be push, 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 and that's going to be their agenda. I mean, here's a guy that, um, like I said, you know, way back, he ran. Here's what an opportunist he is. Back, you know, years ago when he first ran, the Democratic Party had a lot of pro-life. And if you were central or southern Illinois and you were a Democrat, you were probably pro-life. And so he ran as the pro-life candidate. And then as the party moved, um, he realized that ultimately what I want is power and therefore I'm going to be pro-choice. And then if I'm going down, everybody else needs to go down with me in this, you know, immoral worldview. Well, you also see it in the fact that they want to overturn the Hyde Amendment, Jeannie. Well, so, uh, you know, actually, that's the seat you're running for, isn't it? It's the, the former Henry Hyde seat, Peter Roskam seat now, hopefully going to be soon, the Jeannie Hyde seat, um, that will uphold the Hyde Amendment. Well, you know, specifically to my candidate, he has stated that he would love to be the deciding vote to end the Hyde Amendment as he sits in Henry Hyde's legacy seat. So this is a man that doesn't only just want um, what he wants, he wants to be very vindictive about it and wants to basically uh, take it punch to Christians on taxpayer funding of abortion, which has been planned since really Roe v. Wade. It was kind of a truce to some, uh, to some extent in this, this really vitriol debate is that you're not going to make taxpayers pay for it. Well, Sean Kasten's having none of that. He'll have you pay for everything and more. Um, he has said, said some of the most inarticulate, just awful things about Christians, by the way. Uh, just recently, he mocked Marco Rubio for tweeting out a Bible verse. Uh, this guy has no respect for Christians. He's one of 18 members of Congress that refused to say that he has any affiliation with any faith at all. Uh, and, and he, he you know, he's yeah. commonly referred to as the Atheist Caucus, otherwise known as the Free Thought Caucus which does not believe in any faith-based reasoning at all. Uh, his family is contributors to the Center for Inquiry, which you know supports euthanasia and other um, anti-Christian measures. So uh, I'm running against somebody who does not recognize faith in the marketplace, in government at all, as having any role. It is a complete um, abandonment of our core founding principles in this nation. So, you know, not one nation under God, but uh, maybe we should rename that caucus the Humanist Caucus, huh? Yes. <laughs> one nation under the state. Um, Jeannie, you know, for years, uh, the people, the voters in the 6th District elected and reelected Henry Hyde and then Peter Roskam, and then the blue wave came in. What happened? Uh, and can you turn it around? Well, a hundred percent. We're going to we're going to win this race, and it's going. But it's going to take people of faith and people who care about their tax situation and people who don't like self-serving politicians. Uh, and you may fall into all the categories or only one. But regardless, um, you need to vote Sean Casten out for the for the future of your <coughs> for the future of your kids. Uh, look, this, this is a guy. Whenever time, whenever there is a problem that he sees. A need that needs fixing, his only solution is a new government program backed up by massively more taxes. Uh, and, and like, for example, um, the Social Security, everybody knows that Social Security is headed towards bankruptcy by about 2036. The Democrat plan, which Sean Kasten signed on only a few weeks after being inaugurated, by the way, the, uh, and taking his oath of office, the plan that he signed on to raises your social security taxes 20%. Yikes. The solution? No, we need to reform the system for new employees coming in and we need to protect it for people that are currently there. But to tell employers and employees you're gonna be paying more to a failed system that only extends the, extends the bankruptcy deadline by nine years is not a solution. It is the opposite of a solution. It is taking hard-earned money out of the pockets of middle-class families who really need that money. Uh, every solution is a tax solution with that man. P taxpayers should be frightened to death of this guy, and it's detrimental to families. And you are the family institute. 
the Illinois Family Institute, you are more than just faith. You are all of it. You care about uh, education and taxes and the whole, um, everything that, that families have to deal with. Yep. So well, when, when it comes to faith, family, and freedom, Jeannie, especially mm -hmm. religious freedom, um, how important it is, is it that members of our churches get out to vote up and down the ballot, don't stop at the top with the President of the United States, but they go throughout the whole ballot? Yeah, people of faith can absolutely turn this around. In 2018, you're right, there was the tsunami of, of people who wanted, who wanted to vote against Trump who did not understand that they truly did get a tax cut in that 2017 um, tax reform package, who didn't, uh, who believed the Democrat lie about pre-existing conditions. Let's set the record straight on that right now. Let's just take a short pause. In the state of Illinois and in 44 other states, we protected people with pre-existing conditions 23 years prior to Obamacare. The biggest lie sold to the folks, right. that wasn't the case. It absolutely was the case. That's right quite frankly, destroy that individual market uh, for people and, 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 and uh, premiums and, um, uh, and ex, you know, exploded and it's become unaffordable and it destroyed also uh, some of those, those uh, individual policies that were available with people with pre-existing conditions. Now, fortunately in the state of Illinois, you can still get that high risk policy, but you can't get it unless you're in the state high risk pool you can't get access rather to the top teaching hospitals unless you're in the state high risk pool. You cannot purchase that plan on the individual market. Obamacare destroyed that as an option. Uh, so I wanted to set the record straight on that because you're going to you. cast and say that I'll take away people's pre existing conditions. <laughs> Illinois had protections for it 23 years prior to Obamacare. Thank so you for that. Thank one line you. you need to be aware of. There's a lot to talk about in this race, but people of faith must show up at the polls to vote this man out. Amen. Sheriff, are you running into that uh, talking point among Democrats about health care and pre-existing conditions? Have the, you been traveling around the state? Uh, what are folks telling you about that? Is that a top concern, health care? Yeah, I, I've yet to run into anyone. And, uh, you know, I'm travel in, in circles all over the place. I, I haven't run into a couple, but very, very few that think that single payer health care is a good idea. I think, you know, and essentially everyone is terrified that that's the ultimate end game. That's their goal. And that um, if that happens, you know, you will lose what is the, uh, the best health care system in the world. Right. Um, really, there's a very, very small percentage of people that don't have uh, uh, health insurance. And um, we're going to throw everything upside down. There's only, a, they'd say, it's approximately 9% of people that uh, are at, at a uh, poverty level, essentially, that um, just above a poverty level, excuse me, that struggle, that don't qualify for Medicaid. So, <coughs> if anything, that, you know, that, that would be <laughs> taker, um, spot on with regards to Social Security, spot on with regards to, you know, the, the future uh, solvency of Medicare. And the guy that I'm running against, 38 years there, voted for every single, uh, you know, tax uh, spending uh, bill, voted for raising the debt ceiling every single time, rate, voted for everything, every single stimulus, voted for the bailout of the banks. He's the they reason why Social Security and Medicare are, are in trouble. I mean, he's he's it. I mean, so um, for him to come up with anything is just a joke and it's an insult and it's, it's really... Uh, you know, to, to have any, to think that there has any credibility to speak on any of these issues. That's right. But, but here's the thing about Dick Durbin, and I used to cover him at City Hall in Chicago, and when he was out and about, he, the media loves him. He's a sound by machine. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know. And no deeper, can, Monty. He can Did get across the Democratic position yeah. in eight seconds, and you're up against that. Um, so, uh, do, you, do you think the people have been buffaloed by him over these years? They think he's, well, he's a middle of the road guy. Uh, right. No, there's, you're exactly right. You know, I look at Dick Durbin and he, he always presents as though he's so measured and thoughtful and he, he's going to contemplate your suggestion and that he's really just here to serve the people and he presents all that and he's really a, a pretty decent actor, no doubt about it. I mean, had he gone to Hollywood, who knows? But uh, the reality is that Dick Durbin's um, got his power. He's number two in the United States Senate. The whip 
You know, that, there's great significance in that role. And that's because, you know, they know that he'll put for, push forward the far left legislation. You know, he's, he's out there trumping AOC's green proposals right now. But um, he is all of that, Monty and Dave. But I mean, I, I tried over 100 juries. I, I'm, I'm anxious to take some swings at him and, and to really, really hit him hard because ultimately everything he's presented as is a total lie. All right, I've got a question from a panelist. I've got actually four lined up. So I want to start with, um, not panelists, from our attendees, our audience. Um, so this is for both of you, Mark and Jeannie. What is your position on social media companies like Facebook and Twitter censoring conservative content and opinion? How would you address it if elected? Jeannie, why don't you take that first? Okay, it's a free country, it's a free marketplace, yet uh, th these folks have a lot to answer for because they can't pretend to be a, uh, um, a fair platform and then yet censor folks out. So, sure. I mean, the best thing to do is either you compete in that marketplace and you build a better product, that's what we as Americans believe in. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that they're a utility that needs, to, that needs some antitrust protection. I, I, that, that, that bothers me a little bit to go down that road. I, I think we can look at it in the future that way, but I think that really the solution is to, to, to make, make sure that they have the same requirements if they're gonna do censorship as other uh, media outlets and that you can invoke some sort of penalties on them for doing such. Um, I, I would prefer though that, that people just, um, you know, they're, they're so powerful. You mean, how do you get around a Google? How do you get around a Facebook? They're powerful mechanisms to get your word out. We certainly use them as well. Uh, but I mean, I, I don't know. It, it, it's really hard to inform people and they own so many of the same platforms, YouTube and Instagram and on and on that are, are popular. It's, it's a better product than what they've built. You got to give it to them. They're super savvy. So I think we need to look at that if they're censoring, then they should, there should be some sort of penalty treating them like they're a media outlet as well. That's right. Uh, and then right. other than that, we need a lot more awareness. Just people need to uh, be aware of it. And, and I'm hoping that some billionaire builds a better miles trap and, trap and we start to compete against them. Amen. Exactly. You know, because um, this is really, social media has helped organizations like Illinois Family Action get the word out, be able to use Zoom mm -hmm. and broadcast this with two great candidates. Previously, you know, 10 years ago, only the major news uh, outlets could do that. And right. so Mark, any, any thoughts on that? I mean, this is, it's important and it is frustrating to see when we do get um, corrected or fact-checked uh, by liberal uh, social media types. No, I, I couldn't agree uh, more with you. You know, Swopes, you know, they're all, they're far left. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, people go to that and they think that that's somehow the right answer and it's not, it's it's not even close. Um, yeah, and I agree with Jeannie that, that um, there's no fairness there and that most of these people, you know, um, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, you go down the list, they're, they're far left and, and that's what, you know, they're against us and what have you. I. And I, I agree with Jeannie that, that um, you know, we want to be careful just breaking things up for the sake of breaking things up. But I, I think that it's been a long time since we enforced antitrust laws. And, you know, we're in that world now where, you know, we used to have uh, a whole bunch of uh, food companies, a whole bunch of banks, a whole bunch of oil companies. And it just, you know, everything is getting smaller and smaller and, and more and more condensed. And that's, and that's not good for the consumer. Um, you know, that's not good for America. What have you? So I, I think that you know we, we take a look at the Clayton Act, which you know essentially bringing back some uh, some teeth to antitrust, where uh, um, you know we, we don't want to go down that direction again. I mean, look what happened with the banks with the too big to fail and what have you, and we really didn't correct that. So um, right. Yeah. Good. Hey, I've got another question from a, a, a attendee who um, you guys are both uh, Roman Catholic, and we know that the the Christian vote is going to be very instrumental to both of your races. And uh, this gentleman asked, he says, uh, the Roman Catholic Church has rejected the totalitarian and atheist ideologies associated in modern times with communism or socialism. It's the catechism of the Catholic Church. The Constitution of the United States also rejects communism and socialism. 
uh, how can we communicate this to the voters is his question. Any, anyone want to take a stab at that? Obviously, let them know well, that your opponents favor socialism to one degree or another is very important for them to understand. Right. Okay, well, I'll take that first. I mean, honestly, uh, look, I'm a Catholic and I, I you know what? Uh, we do not, I believe, have as strong as faith leaders as the evangelicals and some of the other faiths that will willingly speak up about political situations and candidates and their choices and remind people of our rich legacy uh, from Pope Leo, who, who wrote an encyclical about this, the threat of communism and socialism, and but also wrote about worker rights, by the way, um, and, and, and property rights, which are the foundation to owning your <laughs> So we have a long history of supporting capitalist uh, societies and expecting our, our, our business owners to also be generous and, uh, if, and fairly and treat their employees fairly. We have a long history of doing that. It seems that lately, though, the Catholics, especially under Pope, I, Pope Francis, honestly, has become very liberal in their mindset. And so there's, we do not speak out at the pulpit. I want to give you hope, though. I think, I, I think everybody sh should be well aware that Catholic vote uh, has ponied up about nine point seven million dollars to help elect Trump. Uh, you know, so hopefully some of that residual effect will will feed into our races as well. I think Catholics are largely unaware. They they want to be like many evangelicals or or people of other faiths, Muslim, you name it. They want to appear to be very generous and non judgmental to their fellow man. But there's some places on policy where you just have to put your foot down and say that is not right. Uh, so um, we'll see how this lands, but I, I firmly believe that it's going to be people of faith that are informed uh, through their faith leaders that are going to help uh, bring this election home. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I'm sure in the spotlight here today with Jeannie, who was the one that fought for what Bruce Rauner against taxpayer funding of abortion is an honor for me because ultimately that's, you know, huge it is our liberty and um, as Jeannie said, the Catholic Church is so divided right now. And, you know, for faithful Catholics, they always say that the evangelicals are much more Catholic than, you know, the bulk of the Catholics, you know. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, I mean, it, it's not a line that I made up. That's what most, I think, Catholics that take the faith seriously think. So um, I would say that, that, that there's a lot of confusion out there. And, you know, we, we need to stand on truth and teaching. And I, I mean, there's really nothing... If you go issue by issue in terms of faith, you know, I, I, I agree with the teachings of the church, so I should get 100% of the vote, but I won't. Um, and that's because a lot of Catholics prioritize abortion and a lot of Catholics uh, prioritize um, you know, things that are inherently wrong for America. And so we have to just stand on truth. Ultimately, I think all four of us agree that there's a judgment that's much, much more important than any election and that um, truth is on our side. And that um, it doesn't matter what the polls say or anything else. We, we have to stand on truth. We have no choice. But uh, I'm optimistic. I'm very, very, very optimistic. You know, we're up here in this northern area, and I think Jeannie's, uh, there's, there's going to be a swing back in Jeannie's uh, district. And I think- From your uh, lips to God's ears, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. And, <laughs> and when I get to central and southern Illinois, the energy for Donald Trump is through the roof. Not because they think Donald Trump is, you know, the greatest human being of all time, but the disparity between Donald Trump and Joe Biden is just so large in the future of America and liberty, liberty. David, we just want to be able to, you know, have both faith and the ability to raise our family uh, consistent with what we believe and the ability to provide for our family and not have to give up uh, our faith. <clears throat> Amen. You know, getting back to social media just briefly. I know of a, a state Senate candidate who had some posts taken down by Facebook because he's pro-police and they consider that hate speech. Think of that. Let me ask you this. Do you think uh, Sean Caston and Dick Durbin have been vigorously enough condemning the riots in Chicago, Naperville, and in other cities. What's your take, Jeannie? Okay, um, no, not, not one bit. 
uh, look, and everybody should be pro-police after the flat out uh, near execution of the two yep. police officers. Uh, I think it was in California, I apologize. I yeah, it was Compton, California, yep. Compton, right, it was Compton. And I, I just, you know, I've not weighed in on that issue yet. We are writing something up, but because we have so much to talk about, but that is horrific. Yes. When they are being targeted in such a manner, and it's not, an, it's been happening now for a few years. The, the, this is, you know, this is awful. But it seems as though Sean and, and Caston, Sean Caston said silent. nothing. Complete yeah. silence. Look, there's but there was a, there was a home invasion, armed home invasion, less than a mile from my home about two weeks ago. Uh, only three blocks away from my home, uh, st two stolen vehicles in the middle of the night. Uh, right in the garages, right? They busted into the garage. The, the keys were left in the car, which a lot of folks do, let's be honest. And because they figure they're secure in Wheaton, and you're not. It's lawless all around. Sean Caston has refused to, to, to call it out. And every single congressional Democrat refused to condemn the defund the police movement when they had the opportunity in Congress. They refused to speak up. So and I haven't heard law enforcement. I, I haven't heard Dick Durbin, the number two guy in the U.S. Senate, at least on the Democrat side, uh, say anything about in, in defense of the, the men and women in blue. He hasn't. So Dick Durbin, um, you see that the, the Black Lives Matter crew is essentially in the Antifa and all the other lawless groups are out there um, running the Democratic agenda as far as law enforcement and, and the whole defund the police. I mean, it's just such nonsense. So David, I don't, I'm going to argue that I don't think anybody's run for or been a nominee or, or been in the United States Senate that has more of a law enforcement background than myself. I was a county, state and federal prosecutor, supervisor, you know, served 12 years as the elected sheriff of Lake County, was the interim coroner, have been all over, done both sides, represented dozens of people charged with murder. So, yeah. I mean, I, ha I have more expertise in this than, I think, you know, I was a constitutional law professor for all those years. So the reality is that, you know, the, the brass sometimes in a police union is the same as a teacher's mm -hmm. you know, want. Um, they want everything, and um, sometimes it's a magnet for those that are not the best, the best uh, quality. But at the end of the day, the police, you know, we want more people in this job. The rank and file, the vast majority are just absolutely overwhelming, you know, and um, the job that they do. And the reality is that less people want to be a police officer today than ever in history. And they, you know, yeah, they don't want to work weekends. They don't want to work holidays. They don't want to uh, have a, such a regimented schedule. They don't want to, you know, know that uh, they have to work decades before they have any real um, pension, what have you, and, and they just don't like the, the uh, way police are treated, and there's no uh, reason to get in that business. So we're going to be much, much less safe. So the, reality, right. the biggest truth is, Dave, they don't, I mean, I've been there, and I've seen the psychopathic element. I've represented the psychopathic element. I've prosecuted. <coughs> I've, I've been around it. There are people out there that could kill your whole family, David, and they would sleep like babies. I know. And they, that, that evil exists, and it's in bigger numbers now than I've ever seen it in, uh, in all my years in this business. Well, so that brings me to another question on the, the legalization of marijuana. There are some in Congress who are pushing to uh, decriminalize marijuana and all drugs. And we know that there's a link between marijuana and schizophrenia and uh, violent outbursts. Um, my fear, and I think it's happening across the country, is more and more people are using and becoming addicted and having mental issues, which, you know, unfortunately, the police have to deal with. Look what happened out in uh, Pennsylvania just recently with a, a guy that's running at the cops with a knife. Um, they had to put him down with, with the gun, obviously. It's, um, it's very dangerous for all of us, uh, but especially for the men and women in blue. So I how agree. would you guys you know, deal with the decriminalization yeah. uh, push in Congress? I guess that's my question. Right. So I'll take it, Jeannie, if you want. It, it's just not. So the, the problem, David, is that, it, you know, it's been legalized in all these states and the right. Justice Department uh, is not pushing back on it. So they're not taking any action. You know, would President Trump take action in a second term to try to enforce uh, federal uh, marijuana laws? No, I don't know. That's a, that's a stretch. I think that you're right that um, 
that marijuana is an extremely dangerous drug, way, way under, you know, it kills brain cells, it causes, you know, paranoia and schizophrenia and bipolar, all those have links to, to marijuana. So um, it's a difficult <coughs> one, David, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to roll back the clock on what we did. Um, I just don't know the viability of that. And, um, you know, sure. there, there's so many fights out there. What do you think, Jeannie? Look, I mean, this is this is one of those instances where you you know you have state law, and and there's just it's not addressed in the federal constitution as much as we don't want the federal government dictating other issues. I think this is one of those areas. Sure, you're going to have states that make a determination for themselves. Do I like it? No, I I don't like it, but I do respect federalism, which, by the way, is also at stake in this election. Let's be honest here. It's much e much easier from a democratic viewpoint to control one half of 535 uh, congressmen and senators than it is to control every single level of government at the municipal and state level. And so their pre preference is really to take control and then to federalize many things that we take for granted as something that uh, locally you decide, whether it's in education, whether it's in policing. I, I know there's a comment up here about the um, Police and Reform Act that the Democrats put forth. Look, I am not in, in favor of federalizing everything that we do, whether it's policing, crime-free housing, zoning, and the 5G technology, um, educational stuff. I believe in local control, and most yes. people do. And Thank you. That's I gotta, good. I got to be, I got to be, you know, consistent here to some degree. Yes. I find it harmful to have marijuana. I think people are going to wake up to this and wonder, wow, what the heck did we do to our children? Yeah. And I, I think Jeannie uh, spells it out perfectly, David, and I would agree. And that's a problem with me going to the Senate and picking up on that fight. Essentially, the 10th Amendment, the Reserve Clause, expressly states those powers not expressly stated in the Constitutional Reserve for the states. And it really spells out police power as, as one of those that uh, should be left to the states. That's what makes, honestly, that what, that's what makes, like I have said, uh, truthfully, there's a number of things that all of us would like to do when we get to Congress. For me, it's like putting in budget caps making the 2017 tax cuts permanent, um, you know, uh, making sure that we, uh, our national security interests are, are, are played out the, the best possible, which means funding our military. Um, uh, it means securing our infrastructure from cyber attack. It means taking on the Chinese. It means bringing back all of our, a lot of our core man, uh, critical manufacturing to the United States, incentivizing that in the right way. We wanna get a, we wanna address all those issues. But you can't almost do anything in this country until you address the issue of law and order. Unfortunately, that is truly a state and local issue for which the federal government only has limited access to, to play into. I mean, can they do something? Absolutely. But uh, should the federal government be prosecuting yeah. Antifa? Yes. Well, you know, you can look at that in terms of RICO action, and certainly you've got um, uh, AG Barr walk, walking into Chicago and, and cutting a deal with them so that they can participate in Operation Ledger, which means that they are federally prosecuting uh, gun crimes and, and other criminal acts. That's great, and I think that they should look at RICO action on these gangs that are they're running amok uh, in major cities and, and Antifa on top of it and get to the root of who's funding these, these thugs, these killers, quite frankly. I mean, I, somebody's funding these jokers. That's right. Yeah, it's I would agree for that. the feds to come in, but local policing is still locally in, done, and 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 you know more important. So, do, yeah. would you say that the issue of safety and law and order is at the top of voters' um, concern list? I I think it is. I think it is among the top, definitely among. I think that they are unsettled by what they see across the nation. And I feel feel like COVID has like put everybody in this is sort of just wary sense of about their future, about their kids not being in school. They, every, if everything is here is unsettling. And the crime wave you have seen that's been unarrested and unabated right. and, and, and not um, accounted for yet, right? You don't have lots of people going to, going to prison right. once burned down an immigrant car dealership in Kenosha. Right. And so people are unsettled by this lawlessness because they're getting away with it. Right. And so you have got to bring this back to people so they feel like we're yeah. going to go back to a normal and we can move on and, and 
and get back to educating our kids and taking care of our families and producing goods and services that people want to and and and, and going back to our normal routine routine That's right and so it's on top in. of it that they're always concerned about the future their jobs the health care costs all of it is <coughs> important exactly i think that people that have come immigrants for example are, are really um concerned about what's happening in america especially with the uh with the criminality and what have you in that element david um yeah yeah that's good i have a question from pastor lindstrom uh he says mark are you able to share your race against durbin in terms of the national race trump versus biden does trump help you in your race directly um maybe Jeannie, you want to weigh in on that too and your race Trump helps me when we get to uh, Central and Southern Illinois. The energy is sure. great. They love President Trump. They're really, really proud of the job that he's done. They really love the fact that he's a fighter. They realize what the left is doing, and they think that he's he's the right man for these times. Uh, up north, you know, I came from Lake County. Jeannie's got a portion of Lake County. The reality is Donald Trump lost Lake County by 21 points. So we like Donald Trump, but, you know, it's uh, innocent like dog, uh, cunning like uh, serpent, you know. We, we need to we need to walk that that fine line. I mean, you know, we don't we don't lie. We're honest as as can be, but we're not going to front with Donald Trump. And you know, I think what it happens is a lot of people are, are emotion driven. In the tweets and some of the rhetoric, you know, they can't overcome that for whatever reason. For them, that's all they see. So um, it is what it is. But I haven't. I sell his record. You know, when people want to talk about, you know, did you see what he said? No, I want to talk about, you know, right. you know, what we've done over the that, last. That makes sense. That's good. Now, there's a third person in your race, an independent candidate who may take more than 5% of the vote. Who knows? We won't know. 5, 10, 15%. Uh, does that help you or hurt you, Mark? So I, he, he has to help me. Um, he's not pro-life. You know, he's, he's, he wasn't in favor of traditional marriage. Dr. Willie Wilson. Yeah, he's so you should get all the pro-life vote. Yeah, he's in favor of abortion on demand. He's in favor of gay marriage. He's in, he, he ran as a Democrat always. He has far left uh, policy positions. I can't imagine that, you know, it's tough for somebody that, that believes in any of those issues to reconcile voting for him. Um, he's really, uh, you know, he's a nice guy. He's kind of a gadfly. If you look at his um, newspaper questionnaires, they're really shallow in terms of any, um, you know, real thoughts as to what we need to do. So I, I cannot imagine that uh, he's not going to help hurt me. He's going to hurt me. He's going to hurt Dick Durbin for sure. Because, you know, he is a credible guy. You know, he's an honest guy. And I talk about this. I, I, I went to East St. Louis. And have, you, have you been there recently, East St. Louis? No. So, you know, having lived in Chicago and you lived on the south uh, side of Chicago, I lived on the south side of Chicago. We've been through all the projects. And when the project, even when they're all the high rise buildings and the projects were a lot worse than they are now. East St. Louis just blows them all away in terms of just uh, poverty. A, yeah, poverty and, and just the decrepit nature of the city. And you, you can walk, you can drive down a street block and you will have structure after structure after structure that, that, that went up in flames decades ago and was left to lay in that condition, still lays in that condition. That's his hometown. That's where he grew up. That's where his parents were from. That's where the teachers, you know, and, that molded him. So everybody knows that he's done nothing for black, uh, blacks, and, and um, there's no reason why they'd vote for him. Okay. If, if elected, will you be taking, both of you, uh, a tougher stand in your offices on China than Sean Caston and Dick Durbin? Is it time to decouple from China? So I, I you know, we, we were asked to rank threats, and I put China even ahead of radical Islam as the number one threat to America. You know, China is just, uh, it's the snake. I mean, and I, I've been working with a, uh, Stephen Mosher, who wrote a book on the, on the uh, great Satan, uh, China. And ultimately, you know, you look at what they've done to us economically all over all these years and how, you know, the espionage and, and the dumping and everything else. And, and they don't care if it hurts their economy as long as it hurts America's economy worse. And, and their end game is, is to destroy America. And they haven't really made much secret about it. And then for people to care about human rights, you gotta be kidding me, all the forced abortions and all the executions and everything else, 
really a rogue uh, nation in the way it's been run forever. And, and I, I think it's a horrible place. You know, I stand with President Trump is really the first president in my lifetime I can ever remember calling out China for what it is. Sure. Sure. Good. How about you, Jeannie? Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. China is not just the biggest threat to America, but honestly, to the entire world. Uh, and as they have an aggressive uh, stance, but it's very, they're very patient about it, right? So they've had, a, they have a hundred year plan. It was uh, basically outed in a book called the hundred year marathon. And, and you can read about exactly where they want to go with it. They will uh, pretend to be your friend and then stab you in the back. So, I mean, what China's a threat, uh, you know, they're a human rights violator. They have tamped down on the Hong Kongers. They're being aggressive in the South China seas. And our, our American corporations that are doing deals with these guys really need to, to think twice about it. I mean, maybe in some cases you're, you're making sure that the manufacturing is done without slave labor, but in many cases that's not the case. And to imprison Muslim Uyghurs is not good. To get into a military skirmish on the Indian border, who is an ally of ours, no go. No go. Uh, to, I think that we should all be concerned when they produce a lot of our um, uh, the, our antibiotics and our, our pharmaceutical uh, the, the absolutely ingredients in our pharmaceuticals. We need to bring that back to the United States for manufacturing. Well, um, can we bring it back to Illinois? But, and look at it. I mean, honestly, the U of I, what over 15% of the, the people, the, the kids, students at U of I are, are Chinese. Okay, fine. But the U of I is so dependent upon them that they took out an insurance policy for $1.2 million three years ago to insure against uh, a decrease in their, their Chinese po student population. At the same time, you have a number of Chinese uh, folks who live here and work here, along with American professors, getting in trouble because they're selling secrets to the Chinese. I mean, who's being stupid here? We need a better vet who's coming over here and yeah. make sure that we have an American first policy when it comes to education, especially in the STEM area. Um, Can we be concerned, Jeannie? Yeah. There are problems. Should we be concerned that the Chinese Navy is now larger than the American Navy? That's what I heard recently, at least. Yeah, you know what, though? When I was a transportation officer, we used to say that the, the U.S. Army had more boats than the U.S. Navy. So, <laughs> I, you know, what does that mean? What is the type of vehicle facility? I mean, a lot of this stuff is, is it's like, you know, you have, how many more times can you blow up the world with the number of nukes you have? So it's how you can deploy them the number of trained soldiers. I think it's a concern. We definitely need to compete militarily. Do we need to compete boat by boat by boat? I don't want to get into that race. I don't know that that's the case. We need to have the most sophisticated technology better than they do. I think that the future of, uh, unfortunately, uh, to some degree, armed conflict will be de determined in who controls space. <laughs> that's why, uh, you know what, some of what we're doing with the Space Command and that, that, that President Trump started is something that we need to compete in because if they can control space. And the other critical thing here is like <laughs> if they, the cyber warfare, which could literally shut down our electric grid, is a very serious concern to secure sure. tech that is, is, is of utmost importance. All right. I've got uh, another question from an attendee. And then maybe, Monty, we can go into questions about education choice because Jan Monday asks, how are you addressing the educators union in Illinois? I am studying to become a licensed teacher, but I am firmly Republican and can't support their stance against Trump. I also want to ask about the bailouts for states concerning COVID-19. I don't want to see the states that are doing poorly, such as Illinois, receive a penny of funding to pay debt. I pay enough taxes and they have abused them. Jan, um, Jeannie? Uh, look, I, there's no way that I'm bailing out the state of Illinois, uh, Kentucky pensions, New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, California, you name it. It's <laughs> world to do such, especially in the light of reform. Look, Illinois is the worst of the worst when it comes to mismanaged states. When we go out to borrow, we're three times worse than the next worst state when we, we, when we look at the interest rate that we have to borrow at. So we're not just one of the bad, worst five. We are an outlier, okay? And they have, and let me give you a little illustration here very quickly. It was the, it, when we were deciding budgets this year, when our state legislators were deciding budgets, we were deciding them at the same time Indiana was doing it, okay? So the state of Illinois with the Democrat politicians passed a budget that is 6% higher than last year's budget, which was the highest in, in, in um, the history of the state of Illinois for general revenues. And yet we've had out migration. 
and it was also COVID and they knew they were going to have a reduction in revenue coming in. And they passed it knowing that they had, were going to have a $5 billion to hold a fill and they were hoping for a federal government bailout. What was our slimmer, sexier sister Indiana solution? They decided to pass a budget with a 15% cut. So it's responsible politicians or irresponsible politicians. And there's no way that Indiana federal taxpayers should bail out irresponsible Democrat politicians sitting in Springfield for decades, blowing up the budget. So it's, it's, it, 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 though this is not gonna happen. We're not bailing out these bankrupt states or Chicago, which is at junk status. And which by the way, is really in trouble because their sales tax revenue is going to be down, down and they bonded out a portion of their sales tax revenue for the next 40 years, put it in a special fund. And that's gonna be have the first thing that's gonna have to be funded before they use sales tax revenue for any other thing promised to people like services. And yeah protection good Monty, so, go ahead mark just you know I, I would start with school choice that you know i, I mean i spent a lot of money to send my kids to private schools i i think that th that's imperative um and it, it kills us i mean we're not rich so you know but i think a lot more people would like to send their kids to private schools it's just you know we don't have a voucher system and um of any merit and you know, I think that's critical as far as allowing the parents to to be able to uh, um, see that their children get the best opportunity. I think most people that are honest would recognize the fact that the inner city schools have failed. Right. The best thing for Chicago kids and the best thing for poor kids would be to allow them to have choice. You know, the Catholic schools in in Chicago, and they used to have a zillion more Catholic high schools, and a lot of the poor kids would were able to go. That that's the, been the recipe for success. Amen. And you're, you're in favor of education choice too, right? Yes, I am 100%. But let's let's be honest here again. Education is largely a local issue. <laughs> it's not like I'm going to come in and be inconsistent in this realm. The federal government can absolutely incentivize it through federal tax credits, but they are not to come in and set up federal charter schools or, or, or anything like that. This is something that's going to have to come through the community. Uh, in, in that respect, but it is a local and state issue largely, and so. But this could also fall under the Rubicon of, uh, or the umbrella of uh, parental rights. You know, 100%. Rights. And 100%. that's something the federal government should protect. Yeah, there's right. no doubt. I, one thing I think I agree on, that the NEA agrees on, that the AFT agrees on, all the teacher unions, is that education is extremely important. There you go and their future. We all agree on that. And uh, we need more competition in that space. And parents need to have the best uh, ability to choose for their child what's appropriate. Well, if, uh, Sheriff, you're elected to the U.S. Senate, and Jeannie, if you're elected to the U.S. House, you'll be taking some important votes. Sheriff, uh, you might have to vote for Supreme Court <laughs> Justice. Uh, What's your litmus, litmus test or what Yeah, what kind of uh, justice would you like to see put on that Supreme Court? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, somebody that, that understands the concept of liberty. I mean, you know, Roe versus Wade came out of nowhere. I mean, that's not based in any, um, you know, I, I think the constitutional scholars that are honest will, will tell you that that is not a good, a well-written decision that is not uh, based <laughs> in, uh, the uh, Constitution at all, and it was manufactured. And I, I don't think that we want, you know, courts, um, you know, legislating from the bench. So I, I think that people that understand that is, is critical. I'm sure people would like me to say, you know, well, how do they feel about abortion? Well, they're not going to, they're not, you know, going to be able they're to not say tell that. you that. What's that? No, they won't tell you that. Yeah, they won't say. And typically, you know, they, they don't. There's no reason they they would have said that. I mean, look at Clarence Thomas. I think he's the best best of them all right now. And uh, he's claimed to never have had a conversation about uh, uh, Roe versus Wade, you know, prior to the, his confirmation hearings. And I believe Clarence Thomas, I mean, he's a, he is just the salt of the earth guy. So if he says he didn't have one, he didn't have one. So I think it's, um, it's imperative though, that, that uh, they understand that uh, the Bill of Rights are there and, and that life is, is a right that deserves protection. It's right at the, as Jeannie mentioned at the top, that's right at at the beginning. So, you know, I'll look at their, I taught constitutional law and um, 
you know, I, I want to know whether or not they understand that it, different than Dick Durbin, it's not um, a moving document. You know, there's objective truth right. that speaks in that document. Amen. That's good. Oh, oh, Jeannie, uh, Nancy Pelosi has made uh, repeal of the Hyde Amendment one of her top priorities. And if she maintains the majority there in the House, uh, obviously, if you're elected, you'll vote against repeal. But let's say um, there's a big omnibus spending bill comes your way. And Republican lawmakers, the leadership are telling you, you need to vote yes on this. There's a lot of good stuff in here. But it also includes continued funding for Planned Parenthood. How do you vote? Well, I mean, that, that, that's a really tough vote. I mean, let's be honest with you. It's, it's, you don't want to shut down the government. They're, they're in the majority. I mean, you could probably just vote no because they're going to pass it anyway. Things will get funded. Um, I would, I, 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 hopefully, I, you know, I plan on serving the majority, though. And I plan on securing the Hyde Amendment, truthfully. And I plan on putting on budget caps and, and things that make sense to every taxpayer in this state. Uh, and, and also uh, the penny plan, which reduces the deficit over time in a reasonable manner. Because, you know, that's like, that's like asking me, are you gonna vote for a budget when we don't have the right revenue? Well, you know what? I never did in, in Springfield, but the federal government is a different beast. It just is mammoth, right? So uh, obviously Trump tried to rein in spending, I think, although I think he's a big spender also, uh, but I, I know he shut down the government for, for the most time that had ever been shut down and he didn't win that argument. So he needs a Congress to go along with him so that we can reduce spending. We can get back on a fiscal track. We can put in uh, spending caps and deficit reduction bills. And I think that's the path forward is to do something like that. And I probably, if, if she's in the majority and she's got the votes, I don't know why I would vote for, for her spending plan because I <laughs> guarantee you it's going to increase spending. So there's going to be multiple reasons to vote against a sure. political bill. She has no moderation, neither does Sean Caston. A $16 trillion green energy idea, that's what he's in favor for. 20% increase in Social Security taxes, repeal the 2017 tax cuts. He's all for the progressive state income tax. There's nothing, I think, in that plan that I would vote for, regardless of taxpayer funding of abortion. I mean, I think there's going to be a, I'm not voting for massive spending plans. If you don't put in caps and you don't have a deficit reduction plan that's reasonable and moderate, I mean, uh, look, I understand they had to do what they had to do to fight COVID, but then teeing up a $3 trillion additional spending plan that no. includes universal mail vote in, included, uh, you know, $1,200 checks to illegal immigrants, included debt uh, student debt relief to $10,000 a piece, all, everything in the kitchen sink thrown in there. I'm a hell no. Good. So um, we're running out of time, but I really want to ask you a question about a current controversy on Netflix, a series called oh, Cuties, where they're actually exploiting and sexualizing young girls. Now, as the father of two young girls, uh, I want to punch somebody in the nose, okay? I'm not going to, but I want to. Um, you know, we already canceled our Netflix um, uh, subscription last week, and a lot of people are, but uh, Senator Ted Cruz is out there saying they should be investigating for what they're doing, exploiting these girls. Now, here in Illinois, we have comprehensive sex education starting in sixth grade. And there are some who want to start it in kindergarten. Um, this is intolerable. Um, is there anything you can do on the federal level to crack down and to protect our young children from predators? Especially in the Me Too, you know, in the wake of Me Too. Jeannie, why don't you take a stab at that first? Look, I think Ted Cruz is absolutely right. And I, I reposted his article and his letter to them for calling for an investigation. Uh, I mean, I, I, I obviously did not watch it. I'm not watching child porn. Right, right. I feel like I know enough about it. I've read enough about it to, to understand it. And, and I mean, sexualizing 11 year olds is just wrong. Even some of the lines uh, that they had to read, which I read about, by the way, um, it is sexualizing children. It's just not even in an act, it's in the language and everything else. And 
you know, comprehensive sex ed <laughs> is, 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 is a failure. Uh, second of all, it sexualizes kids too at an early age. It's totally wrong. But I'm telling you what, I'm running against a man who has no respect for women. Uh, Sean Caston tweeted out the pornographic video of Cardi B to make a joke about the weatherization program. Now you go ahead and look up what WAP means and then look at Cardi B's video and lyrics and you'll be shocked that a city well, congressman thought it was funny to tweet this out. Jeannie, he's also, he uh, Sean is. also is a big uh, fan of Dan Savage, who is uh, as raunchy as any shock jock uh, that has ever been on the radio. Oh yes, Dan Savage, who said that evangelicals are pieces of you fill in the blank, <laughs> that all Republicans should be blanking dead. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you know. Again, you're back to Sean Caston, who mocked Marco Rubio for a, 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 um, tweeting out a Bible verse, um, and then he, you know, he doesn't respect women. When you, well, first of all, I didn't even know who Cardi B was until I heard her name in passing because Biden sat down for an interview with her, right. and then to find out that she does all these sexually explicit videos, and then to have my congressman tweet it out. The guy does not respect women. Not I'm glad you're running against him, Jeannie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What We're do you think? Oh, what, do you, yeah. what do you think, um, Mark, as, as a law enforcement I, guy? I, you've you probably know, gone yeah. after some of these guys. Exactly. So um, what I would say, you know, men and women equal in dignity, different in gifts. We're wired differently. I have three boys, and boys are sexual. And, you know, in a, especially at a younger age and what have you, and it's really you're kind of pouring gasoline out of <laughs> I can say that even from my own, you know, perspective, you know, I have struggles. I think most men do. And to the more pornographic that we get, you know, and, and that we throw at them earlier and unregulated, but even beyond, as you said, now we're talking about pedophilia and that's, that's a real thing. It and seems I like we're trying to normalize. Pedophilia. Exactly. I started the sexually violent person bureau in the attorney general's office. I prosecuted the first two juries under that act, which was an act designed at people that were going to be released from prison that they shouldn't be released from prison because if you released them, they would commit another sex offense like that. Yep, and, yep. And so they were contained solely. And so I started that. And, you know, just look at the, the whole trans movement. You know, I mean, the reality is, I mean, we're, you know, Jeannie and I, our hearts are, are not hard. You know, we're soft. We love these people. But the truth is, and the reality is that I prosecuted enough people that, if all they had to do was say that they were transitioning or that they were, uh, you know, think, contemplating being a woman, what have you, and that would allow them to get into a, a girl's room to rape little girls, they'd do it in a heartbeat. And it, it could be, you know, all these far lefties, it could be your daughter or, you, you know, your sister or what have you, and they will do it. That's, that's the world I live in. That's the real world. Not this, you know, all everybody's great and touchy-feely. You know, I mean, there is great evil out there. And, you know, my dad was... Uh, the firm with Newt Minow, who was the FTC. And, you know, it was, I mean, they had some enforcement standards back then. They've just gone off the deep end and what have you. And, and I think that um, I, I agree with Jeannie that these need, they can't, they need ratings and, and we need to, we need to be careful and what have you. And I'm a first amendment guy. I'm not going to call everything porn or, you know what I mean? And, and but when you get in the direction of pedophilia, um, when you get in the direction of, of encouraging the victimization, causing just people to have a different perspective on, on and to see young girls as sexual. I mean, that, this does not, this is not without consequences. No. And you, you know are, what? Yeah. You, you, you young people, young boys that watch this or, or, or even mm -hmm. college boys that may watch this, that it, it, it affects, you know, the their way that they see people. And then they're more likely to see young girls as somebody that they would objectify. And right. there's no end to this. And here's the worst part. Three boys. I, you know, it killed me when somebody had to register as a sex offender for the rest of their life and have their picture up on a, on a website like a scarlet letter and they couldn't live anywhere. I don't want any more people to be victimized like that. I don't want any more boys to be victimized like that. You've got to recognize that these, there's consequences to these. That's right. Well, one of the best things we can do is vote with our wallets on that one and say, I'm not going to subscribe to Netflix anymore. Not as long as they do this kind of... Uh, uh, series uh, that are objectifying young ladies. Well, we're almost out of time here now, and I was wondering if you can give us your final thoughts before we uh, end our webinar today. So, um, 
I'll go. Jeannie, Mark, why don't you go first? Great to have to go first. Go last. Yeah. So, David, uh, go to electcurrent.com. I'm telling people, this is a real, real race. I'm going to get really solid numbers out of Central and Southern Illinois. I was in Chicago in the Chicago media market for all these years as Lake County Sheriff. So people go, oh, you're a Lake County Sheriff. No, you know, I play to the Chicago media market, you know, and people know who I am. And that's why in the primary I got, without any money, I still got 70% of Lake County, 60% of DuPage, 60 plus percent of McHenry, 50 plus percent. Of, you know, I clobbered up here because people know, knew who I was and a lot of people do. And people still know who I am. And, you know, having been a leader on issues like immigration reform and, and uh, criminal justice reform and spoken on, on prison reform and to all these groups over all these years, there is an undercurrent that know who Mark Kern is, know that he's a good guy, know that he's a real deal. Even if we don't agree with him on all these issues, the one thing that they know is that I'm authentic. I'm not Dick Durbin. You know, I'm not uh, some chameleon that's going to lie or tell them whatever they want or pretend to be, you know, oh, good point, real measured. No, they get the real deal with me. And uh, so I have a, a really, really, really solid chance to pull up the upset. Everywhere I go, people tell me, you know what, I think you're going to be the, you're going to be the story of the night. And so go to electcurrent.com. Electcurrent.com. It's yes. time for Dick Durbin to retire. All right. Uh, Jeannie Ives. Uh, Sean Caston has only been in there for two years, but it's uh, two years too long. He needs to retire. Yeah, no, no doubt. Like I, like I said before, if you're a taxpayer, if you're a business owner, if you're a Christian, I mean, for any of those reasons, Sean Caston really needs to be put out of office. Uh, your liberty's at risk. Your uh, he's he does not like Christians. Um, your faith is at risk. But you're you he's going to take your last penny for his big government ideas. And right. don't doubt it, they will do it. Look, uh, America is the greatest nation on earth. God bless our country. Uh, you know, sweet land of liberty, truthfully. And and we have a lot to be thankful to live here in a free country. It can be taken from you. You've seen in five months what they've been doing just by shutting down our public schools for really no reason at this point, no reason at all. We have beat this virus. Uh, you know, we have medically uh, know how to handle it. Uh, our kids are not at risk. And yet you still see a lot of government control in the state of Illinois when the rest of the states are open. So that, you know, the Democrats get in control, they like to control you. And that's not how free people were meant to live. And, and I, so, you know, look, we, we are very generous people in America and we wanna do the right thing and we care about each other, we, we truly do. And I know that that's true in this district. And so your politicians need to reflect that. And they need to reflect solutions that come from the citizenry and not from their fantasy ideas. And, and so um, I'm positive about this, this race. I think people have looked at what the Democrats are selling them and they say, you know what, I, I've seen enough already. I'm not gonna let you go any further. You put us in, in, in charge of the government for a while, we will do really good things on bringing down healthcare costs, on bringing down those deficits, on expanding economic opportunity for our children and securing the blessings of liberty for, for, for uh, the future. So uh, uh, truthfully, if you wanna help me out, we need people uh, to uh, donate, to use your networks, and to really come out and, and volunteer for us. You can go to genieforcongress.com and sign up. Thank you so much for your time today. And that's Jeannie, the number four, Congress, right? No, it's, it's F-O-R-E. I mean, okay. sorry, F-O-R, four. <laughs> F-O-R. Like you golf, got golf on the mic. <laughs> and uh, Sheriff, your website? Electcurrent.com and like Jeannie, I mean, this costs money. You know, we're not we're not going to spend Dick Durbin's money. You know, the Lord doesn't need, you know, he's glorified more. You know, if we don't obsess about money, but we still have money. I mean, we it is an absolute reality. We need money. Absolutely. Electcurrent.com. Well, let me say a quick prayer for you too, and uh, we'll close this out. Just a Heavenly Father, Lord, I just uh, want to lift up Mark Curran and Jeannie Ives to you right now as they run this race. Less than 50 days to go, six or seven weeks to go. And I pray that you give them strength and stamina to make it through the next several months here. And uh, Lord, provide the resources they need, the volunteers that they need, and help them to get the message out to the, to the voters. Uh, I pray, Lord, that the church would rise up, would come out to vote, 
uh, that pastors wouldn't be shy about asking people to vote their biblical values. So Lord, I pray that you would bless Mark and Jeannie and help them get across the finish line. And we pray that they'd be victorious on November 3rd or 4th, whatever day the, the final numbers come in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank well, you. and Thank you. also, uh, you both of you are endorsed by Illinois Family Action. Oh, it's that's a right. Great endorsement. Very, very Thank you. Great. Love the right. organization. Thank you. Good. Right. All right. Thank All you right. for your time. Take care. Well, we'll Thank maybe you. see you after the election when the, the COVID pandemic ends. That's right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. terrific. Thanks. Right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.